EET family, welcome to the voices of my aunt in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm Queen Mother Eni Tere Aset Akua Kiti Haru with the Temple of Het Haru. We have a very special show tonight, but before we get started, as usual, I'll do my Hesse, my normal chant. I'll say it in Meta Netter, and then I will translate that into English. Pa Netter Ampu Pa Maat, Ank Wise De Jeb, Ank Unja Seneb, Uben Nefer Akar Pa In Buharu Maat. In English, that translates to How Sweet Is the Truth, Life, Power, Stability, Life, Prosperity, and Health. Rising always in divine excellence with my aunt every day, all day. Ashe. Ashe. And family, when we say Ashe, we simply mean that we're on the same accord and we agree. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my kings on the panel tonight. And the topic is very interesting. It's going to be called The Verdict. And in that, what we're gonna do is we are going to have a perspective given by my former minister and my current Baba Saba, Ashe. So you all can go ahead and feel free uh, to introduce yourselves and tell the committee you, the black people, about yourselves. Well, I'm Baba Saber Amari Sneferu, a Pan-African Garveyite and Kemetic Saber. I'm dedicated to the resurrection of African people and dedicated to the resurrection of African spirituality. I'm the founder of the Temple of Heteru here in St. Louis, sitting on the Mississippi River, and um, which is uh, kind of ironic being that we're Kemetic and the Mississippi River is considered the, uh, the Nile of the West, you know. <laughs> Shape. to a certain extent but with that said uh, I'm just happy to be on the panel with my good brother Minister Sharon uh, always uh, respected him always respected his views and his work and it's just a joy you know to have him in our midst for the few days that he's in town so uh, welcome to town my brother absolutely Thank you, brothers, brothers and sisters. Uh, first of all, it is an honor um, to be a part of, of the program tonight. Uh, to Queen Mother, um, thank you for inviting me. You could have chosen a lot of people. Easy. And I am sincere when I always say I don't take people's time for granted uh, because they could do a lot of other things with your time. Uh, you have families and, and so many other obligations, but for those of you that will join uh, in listening to this conversation, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say we are grateful and honored um, that, that you have joined us uh, in this time. And uh, as I always say, before I introduce myself, I'm, I'm grateful to my mother, who without her, I would not be. Uh, again, my name is Minister Sharon Hopkins. I am an associate minister with the African Village uh, there in St. Louis. And obviously we're not meeting um, because of uh, the COVID, but under the leadership of uh, Dr. Ray Hagens, where our uh, mission is to empower the minds of uh, African people and awaken them to the truth of who they are as men and women uh, and bringing forth unity uh, as we say, unity in the community. Um, you know, we, we, we want brothers and sisters just to renew your mind uh, by the way you've been taught and the way we've been taught. And uh, so anytime I have a, a chance that can share any kind of enlightenment with the brothers and sisters, then absolutely, uh, that's what I do. So to Brother Saber, uh, Sister Frankie, uh, even to all the brothers and sisters in the conscious community, Dr. Ray Hagens and the members and brothers of the African Village, uh, it's just an honor to be here and be a part of the panel with uh, a great Saba uh, that is also about the liberation and the empowerment of our people. Ashe, mm -hmm. Ashe. Okay, so uh, Baba Saba and Minister Sharon, as I said, you guys are gonna go ahead and just uh, get started. 
We're talking about, everybody knows the verdict, so we know what we're talking about. So, uh, Baba Seva, would you go ahead and do us the honor of getting started about your perspective concerning the verdict? Well, I'm going to always uh, come from a Black perspective, you know. In, in, in America, you know, what they call it the melting pot, you know. In my opinion, it's not such a great idea, you know, in comparison to, say, China, who have one people, or one uh, culture. And uh, it's probably a lot easier to get things done when you don't have, let's say, for instance, in America, you got these two political parties constantly arguing with each other. And then you have African people living in America, whether they from the diaspora or, or whether they from the continent, that because of your black skin, you're treated differently. And there's a whole history and legacy of how we've been treated from the very beginning since we first touched foot on these shores uh, off of slave ships. So obviously we couldn't possibly have the same politics as those who came here as free individuals. So with that said, we have to find a way to survive in this, in this, 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 this um, schismistic, for lack of a better word, atmosphere, trying to make our way every generation have, having to go through its trials and tribulations, but yet we still uh, know how to smile. We still know how to laugh. We still experience joy. We still uh, 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 entertain and we still celebrate and we still excel. And, uh, and so we, we, we have this duality of existence here where we refuse uh, to be, to allow our humanity to be smothered, but yet we continue to fight. And we talk about George Floyd, you know, and that fits perfectly in that, in that, in that, in that narrative. Because George Floyd, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing new about what happened to this brother. Absolutely nothing new. Even in our short lifetimes, you know, this has happened several times just in our short lifetime, not to mention the lynching and going all the way back to when they tied our ancestors up. But they would take the brothers, the strongest, most confident brother. They would tie, uh, tie his right limbs and his uh, up uh, with a horse, tie his left limbs up with a horse, and put them in the opposite direction, and fire a gunshot, and and then the horses would run and split the brother in half. These are the types of things that has happened to our people, uh, as an experience of being here. And those are, those things were done to affect the mind the mind of a people. And, um, and uh, you know, a friend of mine would, was talking to me the other day and we was talking about, we've been out of uh, chattel slavery, you know, for quite some time since, you know, 1865 legally. And um, we still have the mental effects of it. We're still suffering no from uh, our lack of understanding of our position in the world. Our goals, in my opinion, are all wrong, you know. But so, so George Floyd is nothing new. But, but if we were to give our perspective, I would have to say that as a comedic saber, it's, it's important. And as a minister, from his perspective, I'm sure it is important for us to try to offer our people a different way to look at things or either a more sound way to look at these things. And so I'm glad that you invited us to have this conversation because we, we may discuss some things or some perspectives that the average person may not have thought of, especially uh, in our community. Ashe. You know, Keith, Keith Ellison is something that stands out in my mind in terms of my uh, perspective. Uh, you know, he's the attorney general. You know, in the case, uh, he took over the case. And so the responsibility of an attorney general is to, in these matters, is to, is, he's like a prosecutor, you know, so to speak. He's supposed to make a determination uh, to what level does this crime rise to. And then after he made that determination, he's supposed to, you know, bring charges. 
And, uh, and that, the problem I have, and I posted, I posted my opinion on this. I have a problem with him posting. I mean, not posting, but uh, charging um, uh, Derek Chauvin uh, second degree. And uh, among the other charges, I think that he should have charged him with first degree murder. And the reason I say this because I've heard, I've heard uh, early in the game, you know, what his his reasoning was, and I've heard it before in similar cases like this. And uh, they usually come from the angle that, well, they're trying to estimate, you know, they're trying to estimate uh, their uh, potential of success. And so they say, eh, judging the, the level of racism, judging the climate, judging these other exterior factors, uh, I want to be successful, so I'm going to charge him with something that's possibly lesser in an attempt to be successful. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm just in 100% disagreement with that mindset, that idea, that perspective, because I don't think that they hired you to do that job to, to estimate. Your job is to identify a crime and put the appropriate label on that crime and then let the chips fall where they may. You know, he may have been con concerned about unrest. He's like, well, well, if I don't get some kind of conviction, it might be unrest. That's not your job. Your job is to identify the crime and put the proper label on the crime and charge the person appropriately. You know, and if the society is so sick in its ability to make a good judgment, then the unrest and all of those things that take place following, that's what that, that society deserves. That's what that society earned. And maybe those are the type of things that can bring healing after that unrest or whatever it, the case might be because it's just an estimation that it would be unrest. So I'm disappointed. I'm not disappointed in anything that the European has, will do or has done because I, they've been doing it for so long. But I'm disappointed in the behavior of, of our people. You know, I expect something out of Keith Ellison because he's a black man, he's an educated man. He know the history. You know, I expect something, you know, I, I was proud of the young lady, what's her name, Darnella Frazier, the sister that, the 17 year old young lady that took the video footage because they had actually, the police had actually concocted a lie because I believe the, the police chief uh, in that particular town is actually a black man. They had concocted a lie and turned the lie in <laughs> and it was going to get away with it until this young lady's video surfaced. Yeah. Chief was able to see it. But so that, that, that compounds the evil that you are literally lying about it. You know, so to me, that should have been a, another consideration in terms of him, uh, whether or not first degree was more appropriate. But that, that's just a, a part of the dynamics of this whole thing, because we know that it's much, much bigger than that. But, you know, dive in anytime you like, my good brother, because I know you're just as passionate about these matters as I am. Yes, sir. Okay. So my perspective, if, uh, if, if I may, I don't know if you were done, Bubba. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I didn't quite. Um, no, go, go right ahead, Minister Sharon. Um, so my perspective is, is much that of yours, uh, Brother Saber, but obviously uh, I was extremely uh, disappointed in the reaction of our people um, with, with the celebration, even though I understood Ooh. that I thought it came from a genuine place of, uh, you know, they, they were finally glad as a people finally glad to see some level, quote unquote, of so-called justice uh, of what has been obvious uh, to me was a murder, you know? And so many times in cases like this, many of our people have had to deal with the fact of seeing the obvious, i.e. a Rodney King, i.e. a Freddie Gray, We've had so many examples, Breonna Taylor, uh, Mike Brown in St. Louis, you know, 
where it was clear and obvious that it 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 felt like murder. Humanity had been uh, mistreated. You know, a life was lost. And at the end of the day, all these officers, most of them, you know, have walked away. And it's interesting because I was talking about this just a few weeks ago, where in the last five years, there's been some 6,000 murders of Black people at the hand of cops, yet we've had under 150 conviction of those cops. And of those 150 or so convictions, only 42 of them uh, got charges of a felony. And of those, half of those were reduced to some level of a misdemeanor, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you just break it down on that level, you know, 6,000, but only uh, under 150 were brought up on any kind of charges. And of that 150, we're talking about 42 so-called indictments or, or you know, uh, time or any kind of time being served on a felony. And then of that 42, more than half uh, were reduced to a misdemeanor. Uh, mm. that, is, that, is, that is quite shocking and sad. So I understand why our people Horrible. were were celebrating. But for me, it was heartbreaking because to me, it just says how ridiculous this criminal justice system is, how unjust it is, uh, and it needs to be reformed. And this is what we mean when we say uh, defunding the police, not that we're trying to take money away from the police. You know, it, it's amazing to me that white people refuse to understand and they refuse to allow themselves to grasp the idea that defunding the police does not mean that we're going to take money from the police. That is not what it does mean is that we're going to reallocate the resources of how those funds are used, i.e. a lot of our people, whether regardless of color, some of those crimes are due to mental illness and police are not equipped to deal with mental illness. You know, they, they need to be turned over to the professionals that can better assist them. And too many times cops are asked unfairly to serve in a role that they're not qualified to serve in uh, and assess somebody's mental health. You know, they're not qualified professionals. Another problem that I have in speaking with qualifications, when we look at the police system, how many officers actually have degrees? You know, they're not educated. A lot of our officers, most of them, they come out of college and policing becomes kind of almost like a last resort. Now, there are some great cops. Most cops, I believe, are genuine. I think they're awesome. I think they mean well. But we, you know, um, too often just hear about the bad apples that ruin it for most. But there needs to be a re-examining of the qualifications to become a police officer. You know, uh, I, I hope that becomes part of that uh, George Floyd bill that they're trying to um pass of, of, of there's a level of qualifications that needs to be there but just dealing with the verdict itself and let's focus on the charges uh we talked about second degree murder right and so when f for me and my understanding of law and i could be absolutely incorrect but the reason why i believe that the brother was not even though i felt like he should have been charged with first degree murder because his actions warrant that but first degree murder entails an intent an absolute intent to kill as in premeditated and so because when you have this criminal justice system that is um, stacked up against our people there are so many loopholes that I believe 
they would have charged the brother with first degree murder, I believe unequivocally he would have walked. Uh, hands down, he would have walked because there was enough evidence in the video prior to the death that said, yes, they had him handcuffed, but yes, he was struggling. Yes, we, we see there was some sort of resistance. And there was a resistance of him trying to explain. And I believe the prosecutors would have uh, justified the struggle. And just like they did in the Mike Brown case and the Freddie Gray case, they all just- All the million other cases. Yeah, all the, all the million, you know, <laughs> they, they, just, they justified when the charges yeah. were brought up as first degree the ounce of resistance or explanation that the perpetrator was trying to explain to the officer, I believe number one, uh, they would have used that to let that brother get off because it, it, can we say when he woke up and he got that call, can you unequivocally say that he intended without a shadow of a doubt to kill George Floyd. But what you can say is without a shadow of a doubt, his excessive force and his lack of judgment in using his training as an officer definitely led to the death of George Floyd. Hence my understanding of the law, meaning now second degree murder, because with all the layers of protection that the police have, are we, is there enough in there to say that you know without a shadow of a doubt in his mind, that's what he intended to do? And I don't think there was enough there to say that you could read, a, read anybody's mind, except for when you see the charges of retaliation and things that we see, that yes, that is first degree murder when we can de determine in so many cases that it was predetermined, but all that happened in the course of line of duty as my understanding of the law and with the confines of his job, but he failed to use good judgment. Now in a, in a just society where we treat everybody with humanity. In a what society? Get, in a just society. Oh, okay. Well, and when we treat everyone with humanity, and we I treat it, we treat people, uh, and we 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 let ethics and we let the rules of my eyes uh, of, of truth, justice, reciprocity, reciprocity, balance, harmony, faith, and all those things that you and I, uh, brother Saber, ascribe to. If we live in a land where that is a principle, then absolutely, you know, that is first degree, even in most countries. But here in the United Snakes of America, Come on. There, there's absolutely no way that because of the footage, I don't think there was, in my opinion, an unequivocal, uh, no questions asked, first degree murder when you're talking about a person's mental intent when he first got to the scene. That's a hard thing to prove when you are an officer of the law. And that's why I think for me personally, I think it's first degree, but under the letter of the law, <coughs> loopholes of the law, that was a hard thing. And so you had a brother like Keith Ellison, who by the way, uh, it cannot be understated that this brother was under the teachings of Minister Farrakhan for years. You know, he, he was a, a member of the nation of Islam. And, and so this is what happens when you have an educated brother who understands the truth, even if he doesn't understand it to the level of you and I or vice versa, he understands the basics of humanity because of the teachings that he went through. And so this brother made sure that he brought outside resources in and he made sure that 
every rock was looked at and, you know, um, a blind person would have been able to convict, <laughs> you know, uh, on, on this. And so I don't necessarily, um, for me, I, I, I just think because of the nature of the law, not because they would have yielded unrest, which, you know, would have yielded unrest. And, and, and two, when we talk about yielding unrest and the unrest that happens, does, does America deserve it? Yes, she does. But the thing that I would, would, would always say to people is if you're going to do unrest, we got to stop having the unrest where we live. You know, we, we, we oh. too often, we, we don't need to have it at all, right? But we destroy our own communities. <laughs> You know, I want to speak to uh, uh, something, that, uh, an aspect of what you were saying before we get into the unrest part, which is very important, and that is uh, about first degree. Um, you know, in the law, in the spirit of the law, it's just implying that if a person, you know, I, I remember in times, you know, we grew up in St. Louis, you know, there were be, there would be incidences of brothers and sisters to go out and party on the weekends and uh and sometimes there would be an altercation and uh if there's a fight that ensued or in the heat of the moment one person takes another person's life that would automatically be considered second degree murder because it was a crime of passion in the heat of the moment but if that person was to walk and go to their car and the car is seven blocks away you know and then go in the car and get the gun and come back seven blocks away. Um, most juries would see he had cool off time. He had an, a, a, there was an opportunity for him to think about what he was getting ready to do. And if he then came back after all of that cool off time, seven blocks of walking, and then killed, that crime would elevate to first degree. First degree. And, so, and, and see, and and so in that vein is what I'm is the way I see this incident. Uh when this when this devil of an officer, yes, uh when this Peach. this this subhuman being, in my opinion, and I don't I don't have to be shy about saying what I see. I when check. he put his knee on this man's neck, not for one minute, not for two minutes, not in the shuffle and the scuffle of the moment, but nine minutes. And during those nine minutes, there were points, say after the third, and after the fourth, after the fifth minute, there were points where people around him were literally begging him to stop, telling him you're, you're killing him, you're going to kill him, begging this man to stop. This man calmly with a hand in his pocket, if you read the expression on his face, he wasn't in a he wasn't in a moment of passion. He wasn't in a moment moment of, of, of scuffle. This man was 100 percent relaxed. He 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 actually you could see it in his face that he actually could hear the people pleading to him to stop. And with one hand in his pocket, he comfortably, obviously made the decision, I'm not gonna stop until all the breath is out of this man. And his face in the time. And the video footage was so important because it captured that long time. And, the, and, and he could hear, he could hear the victim's voice saying that I can't breathe, saying that calling for his mother. This man was absolutely clear about what he was doing. And I think that video captured all of that. But see what it boils down to when you're talking about a jury trial. Mm -hmm. That is. You know, that's a product of the system that's designed. And we have to understand as a people, the human beings make systems. I say. And the American system in no way is perfect. But some of us, you know, when you glorify another people and put them on a pedestal, you think everything they produce was produced by God. The white man is not God. You know, I know uh, Black people feel may feel insulted by that comment. But if you really think about it, and those who really study, you know, uh, post-traumatic slave dis disorder, they would tell you that perhaps a lot of us perceive the white man as God. 
because they don't question anything. You know, they think that a law is something that is just handed down by God. And, it, and, 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 if, and if the laws say this, then that's the way it is. Laws are adjustable. Laws can be altered. They can be changed. They can fit, be fixed. But one of the flaws in the law or the system mm -hmm. is yeah. the jury system in and of itself. You know, you got 12 jurors. You know, you might have a couple of educated people in there. You might have a couple of um, uh, regular hardworking individuals. You might have some, some, some tobacco spitting Hoosiers in there. They don't have a liquor sense. But these 12 people come together and deliberate. And a lot of them may not even understand the scope of the issue that's at hand, but they hold people's lives in their hands. Mm -hmm. And so the, the lawyers do the best they can to make their case. In this case, we had the advantage of video footage. Anybody that would look at this case, this would be seen by normal people as an open and shut five minute deliberation type of case. The video footage says it all. This is so obvious. This is first degree murder in such an obvious way, considering what I said about the weight. Had several of about, those. About the hand in the pocket, about the expression on the face, about the, about, about the listening to the pleas of individuals begging him to stop. When you refuse to stop doing something, when people say it's going to kill the individual and you choose not to stop, it elevates the first degree. So I believe in the way, in the, way the, uh, the verdict was, came back guilty on all charges, on all three counts. I believe that this video footage was so compelling that a first degree would have been successful. I think he would have been, it, it's rare, but I think in this particular case, in the way that that verdict came back, I think it really, I felt in my gut that a first degree would have gotten the same uh, guilty. Uh, like I say, we just speculating, but I just believe that the fact that it came back so strong, a guilty verdict so strong, I cannot not help but believe that as a part of Keith Ellison, this, 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 this wondering, you know, will there be a backlash in terms of the energy that he faced uh, when it comes to the community? Because he did miscalculate, in my opinion. And, and he does, he probably made a miscalculation based on the history. And, and I guess that's a, uh, that's a legitimate way to evaluate something. You know, the best predictor of what a people will do is to study what they have done. So from that perspective, I think he, he felt pressured to produce some kind of a guilty product on behalf of the black community. I think that's what he was feeling. I can't speak for him. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I would say, moving forward, let this be a lesson. Don't worry about the feeling. Huh? May I interject for one second, uh, Baba Sabre? So let me throw this out there to the both of you. So do um, you all feel that his strategy was what he, his decision that he made to handle the case in which that he handled it? Do you all feel that um, it was a strategy versus justice? A strategy versus justice. Well, I think it was a strategy on, I think mm -hmm. it was a strategy on his part based on the words that he said early, you know, last year when it, when this stuff came up. I, I just think he felt pressure that he has to produce something. And so I think he made, he made a, he had made a decision and he, he probably made a decision uh, based on what he believed he could do, uh, but but you know hindsight is Kinda always like twenty. Something is better than nothing. Right. So hindsight is always twenty twenty. Uh, he, you know, maybe he didn't trust the compelling nature and the power of the video itself, even because we saw what happened with Trayvon Martin. We knew that the nine one one caller instructed him not to follow or pursue this man. You would think that those instructions would weigh heavy in court, but he didn't even make it to court, you know. Uh, so, so he was probably estimating the mindset of the society that he lived in and the heart of the people. And uh, I'm pretty sure we may get into this thing talking about the heart of a heart of a people. Those jurors are regular people. They saw that tape, but the history in America is that 
this racism is in the core of so many people that they know what they're doing when they convict black people. It's not a legal thing, it's a deliberate, I'm sending his black ass to jail. Uh, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to exonerate the people who kill these animals called black folks. You know, this hatred is so strong that it's in the people, it's in the system, you know, and it's in the, uh, it's in the behavior of cops who know that they're fellow cops. See, when you work on a job, I've worked on, uh, you know, I come in, I, I come up in the building trade. And, uh, you know, when people are intensely involved in their job, a lot of times you don't have time to think about race. You start thinking about the performance of that particular worker or that employee. And, and when you're trying to do something together, sometimes you forget about race until, until to 3.30 when the clock, you know, we go back to normal life. But when you're working together, sometimes race is not an issue as much because you're working together trying to accomplish something. And yeah, at that time, a person's ability is really ranks them in terms of their value uh, until that clock hits, you know. Uh, and I've seen this. And, um, but we could identify the individuals on the job who are racist. Even though they did, even if they didn't behave it, behave in that manner outright, you know everybody that works on a job, <clears throat> I'm sure that they could probably evaluate and tell who among the black folks were sort of militant, you know. And uh, but we behaved in such a way that we could get the job done. But as I relate that to the police department, they know who those races are, and what America has failed to do is to purge these races from their police department, they failed to do it. And in many cases, some of the black officers are intimidated and feel uh, uh, complacent and not motivated to stand up. And many times some have tried and have suffered the consequences as it relates to their career. But, and I'm gonna let my brother respond, but on a, let's give an example, like Lloyd Austin, the guy that just uh, received a position as secretary of defense, the Biden is a tall, big, huge black man. One of the first things he's done was to set up uh, this evaluation process, trying to see how many racists that he can identify in the military. See, those are the kind of things that catch my attention. There's a black man that says, I'm not gonna be intimidated by the history of this system. I'm, the first thing I'm gonna do is try to purge out the white supremacists from the military. Now, whether he's successful or not, I don't know, but I'm saying those are the type of things I expect to see out of black people who are in positions of power, even though you're in a flawed system, a, a, a system of criminals. And let's face it, the government was set up by criminals. And every moment that we live in this country, we're perpetuating the crime, the original crime. So yeah, I, I just, all that goes into the, the pasta, all that goes into the soup in terms of evaluating these things, these kinds of things. You talk about the nature of a people, you're talking about the, the system of a flawed jury, and you're talking about the heart of the individuals who are making decisions about our fate. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I think you said something very, very powerful. You, you said earlier, you said in a normal, circumstance for normal people it would have been an open and closed case in five minutes and i think that's a very important statement because the thing is you said normal but you have to understand for, for me and i'm sure for you as well we're, we're not dealing with a normal people hmm. if we, we are dealing with a and at people, right? We're dealing with a people who don't operate from a spiritual place. You follow me? They're not a spiritual people. So, you know, they're a very linear in their thought, whereas we're very holistic in our thought. So when we talk about the jury system and how that is flawed, you know, when we say a jury of 12 peers, most of those people on that jury, even with a conviction and taking this case out, 
off the books, most of our people are not convicted by juries of their peers, you know? And so that's something that we need to look at because when we're considering crime, it needs to be met and, and looked at through a certain level of, uh, of passion and sensitivity or uh, necessary force that is deserving of that moment. And sometimes that is only going to happen when the people on the jury looks like the person that is on trial. You follow me? So a lot of times, and, and I agree with you, um, Brother Saber, we are not going to get the convictions that we need to get because most of the time, you know, the juries do not look like you and I. It may be a few of us on there, but, you know, how many of the people that you work with and that you are around every day are European? Most of the people I'm assuming that you interact with, they're people of your kind. The people that you're giving services to, that I give services to, they're people that look like you and I. You know, so that's another element to reforming the criminal justice system is that I think that, you know, the jury needs to be made up of people in which that individual is of. I know that probably won't happen. But when we say a, being judged by a jury of our peers, I think that's something that we, because Europeans cannot understand. You know, I, I, I think if it was a jury of all black people, right, the case would have been resolved in one hour, mm -hmm. as you say, open and shut, you know, and so that that too what did the is, jury look like do we do we do you all know what the jury looked like no i i i i don't i don't know but i i, I, I don't know yeah i, I don't I, know but i'll go ahead go ahead brother. yeah I, I i would venture to say it wasn't 50 50 you know i i would i, I can guarantee you there wasn't yeah. six, it's, it's six never black people and six white people on that jury i can guarantee you that uh, without a shadow of a doubt, and and I and I and I'm telling you that I don't know, but you know, dealing with uh, brother, do we think it was strategy or justice? You know, brother Keith Ellison said it himself. Uh, he he made it a point to say it in his press conference that he did not feel as though justice was served. But it was but a what, step. I think he said but, it was like a step. He he said that he felt it was a you're right a step in the right direction and he felt like the conviction you know met you know some sort of, of, of sound uh decision that that was made but he made it a point to point out to america that he unequivocally felt as though it wasn't justice but i think he used the word but at least we were able to hold someone accountable because for him accountability was important. And he made that distinction in his press conference after the um, verdict. And, and you know, he, he let the family know publicly that he felt like it was injustice because justice, you know, absolutely means returning things whole. And, and, and so even from the premise, like he said, there will never, ever be justice because George Floyd will never, ever be back. So, you know, number one, we have to understand justice was not served on that level either. And, and I thought he did a wonderful job of, of uh, telling people, hey, we understand that you're happy, but please understand that even though we got a conviction, justice was not served and so what do we do and, and and how do we go from here i i think is the ultimate question and for me you know i've said this many times before how do we get police officers uh all across america to do their jobs 
and stop crime regardless of color, but in particularly when it deals with us as black people, how do we get police officers to respect us as human beings? Because all the deaths that have happened from Mike Brown in, here in St. Louis to George to, Floyd. To the 16 year old young lady who was just gunned down. Just, that, that blood is ultimately on our hands and not the police. It's, it's on us as black people. And we are 100% responsible for all those deaths, and if, even if we just start at, you know, 2014. And why do, why do I say that? Because yes, please if, tell us, Minister. Because if, if we should have learned from uh, Trayvon Martin, okay? But we didn't learn from Trayvon Martin. We didn't learn from Mike Brown, Freddie Gray, Tiana Taylor, and we have not learned even from George Floyd. You know, we, we as black people, whether we're conscious, whether we're Christian, Muslims, Jews, as black men, we, we collectively are absolutely a disgusting group of people that really need to clean our butts up and start holding people accountable. And so for me, it's very passionate when I say this, and I'm saying it from this perspective. I believe for me, we will, we will start seeing justice or I won't say justice, but we will start seeing a different outcome when black people are encountered, when the police pull us over when we start giving the necessary reaction that's required and what is gonna be required. When they take one of our lives, and I really don't wanna say this publicly, but I'm gonna say it because I think it needs to be said. When they take one of our lives, I don't personally think that we need to take that officer's life. You know, we don't need to go off after the officer when he kills one of us. What we need to do and what's going to get their attention unequivocally is if you kill someone in the manner in which you killed a George Floyd, a Mac, Mark Brown, and this sister that was killed the other day. Mike Brown. Uh, Mike Brown, when, when you kill us and slaughter us like this, we don't wanna kill the officer anymore. We wanna kill his mother. We want to kill his father. We want to kill his grandchildren. We want to go after all his loved ones. And he needs, he or she needs to feel that pain that we are feeling. Now, if there is a legitimate crime that is being committed and the officer genuinely feels like his life is threatened and he has to make that decision, by all means, you do what you got to do to protect your life. But under no circumstances should we have officers with no, no regard for black life, no hesitation to take it out in their action because they feel as though there's not going to be any consequence, right? So if they, if they feel like there's not going to be any consequence in us as men, right? Not women, but us as men, or not willing to step up to the plate and say enough is enough. And we like, like when they went to that, that Lieutenant's house that was there in Carolina that, that pushed that black boy on the sidewalk that was walking in the neighborhood. What did those young people do? They went to his house and they questioned him. What I would have liked to have seen is if they went to his house and beat his family down and beat everybody down. So what is that going to solve, people say? that That's just perpetrating more violence. It may be perpetrating more violence, but for me, it's getting the attention of the officers to say, hey, if I take this life, is my family's life in jeopardy? See, they don't have a fear of us when they interact with us, 
because there's no consequences to their behavior. And if there is a significant consequence to their behavior and they start losing the lives of their lo loved ones at our hands, right? And, and, and we, we're not identifiable, then what, what do you think will happen when they go to shoot one of us that's uh, committing a crime? I would hope, I don't know, but I would hope that instead of shooting us three times in the back to kill us, they would shoot us one time in the leg. Ankle, I, I shake. You know, I, and yeah. so for me, it, it, it's mm -hmm. not that I'm saying we need to go kill to be killing. I'm just saying some sort of action needs to be taken to get the police officer's attention. It has because, to be taken. Because again, by and large, we are dealing with people who are not equipped to deal with the psychodynamics that the job requires, which I think entails them. And, and it, 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 it is necessary that they go and get education and training. And you should not be able to be a graduate that. out of high school with no college training or degree and become a police officer with a gun. That, 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 I, I want to re respond to uh, Yes, sir. Well, and, and then interject something that we haven't really started talking about. And that's uh, <clears throat> a couple of things. Uh, sentencing, you know, because we know the sentencing is coming up. And then, uh, the, you know, the question of justice. You know, America is never hesitant. Say, or, or, or Israel is never hesitant. You know, if the Palestinian person straps on a, a bomb under their clothes and go on a city bus and then blows themselves up and blows uh, some of the uh, their fellow transporters or, or, or riders, uh, they quickly respond by sending an aircraft or, or a drone over into the Palestinian territory and do some strikes. And they call it when, 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 saying we're going after the, the particular group, but when they kill civilians, they call it, you know, uh, they put a pretty word on it. They call it, uh, they call it a, a, a casual. Uh, <clears throat> casual fire? No, 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 no. Um, Casualties of war? No, no. <laughs> I don't know why it escapes me right now. But they have these colorful, gentle words they put on uh, uh, when they go after somebody and get re and basically retaliate. You know, they retaliate, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they get revenge. They get revenge. <laughs> I mean, it's just simple. They do it I every said. single time. They don't do it sometimes. They do it every single time. You know, Joe Biden's he, just now in office, he planned a strike, you know, uh, against the Iranian forces uh, because it would happen to Khashoggi. Khashoggi, you know, the reporter. What I'm saying is they 100% of the time always strike back with death, you know, but the standard is always very high when it comes to black people. Black people are always expected to not consider violence as a response. And like the brother said in much of his comments that those days are over, that we have to consider violence as a response, not just burning a building down, but the loss of a life, because that's the only language apparently that they understand. You know, I agree with the brother, the cheering, you know, it almost made me sick to my stomach. I was, I, I mean, the feeling that I had when I saw the cheering was a, a feeling akin to embarrassment. I was embarrassed because George Floyd, this man lost his life. And whether you win a case or not, cheering, that's not the right kind of energy. That's not appropriate to, even if you were successful in the court trial, a response of cheering, brothers and sisters, where did that come from? That was the last thing I expected. <clears throat> I could see these people feeling a little bit encouraged or uh, some people feeling um, a degree of satisfaction for this one portion of the criminal justice process, which I don't have no faith in it. But cheering, really? You know, that, I just, 
I just thought that was embarrassing because it speaks to <clears throat> the question of Black Lives Matter. See, all of this stuff boils down to the question of does Black Lives Matter? You know, we like to use that mantra. You know, we want the world to hear us say Black Lives Matter. We got white folks in the street, white liberals in the street saying Black Lives Matter. You know, and, uh, and this thing is, is overplayed because the bottom line is that's not how you demonstrate whether or not Black Lives Matter. When white folks retaliate for the loss of their life, the way they prove to the world that white lives matter is that they go take a life. Absolutely. Then everybody's convinced. And often, and often they would take a, a double or triple the amount of lives comparable to the amount of lives they lost. Because the, the underlying subconscious message would be that white lives must matter because we suffer like hell when we take one. And it's the same, it's the same logic. It's something that we don't want to face because we've been trained and taught through the process of enslavement. Uh, that fear is the, is the dominant force that guides our behavior and our thinking. You know? And when we talk about the individuals in the jury and whether what's the proportion <clears throat> of white versus black, even in that dynamic, you can have 50-50 or you can have 75% black on the jury. But a lot of times, what kind of mind do many of those black folks have? Mm -hmm. You know, because of the indoctrination, we got to deal with black folks with black skin, but white minds. Absolutely. You know, you know coming out of the Civil War um, in the late 1890s, they uh, had uh, what I believe was, it was actually in the year 1890. They had a conference called the, the Mohonk Conference. And it was a conference on uh, how are we going to educate the quote unquote Negro after slavery? And white folks, not one black person was invited to their conference. White folks sat down and decided on the education that black people would get. And they needed an education, they decided that we need an education that would make them passive. Yes. They selected, uh, even immediately after the Civil War, mm -hmm. the type of things when they allowed us to, uh, when they said, well, the Freedmen's Bureau set it up where they're gonna teach black people how to read and write. They chose what they would allow us to read. Did you know the only thing that was chosen as for us to read was the Bible? The Bible, I should. Exclusively the Bible and only passages of the Bible they promoted pass, passive behavior. Mm -hmm. So these people created an educational structure. They spent time in a conference designing an education for us. And you're seeing the products, the kind of thinking that you see in many of these black politicians or the civil rights leaders. These people are products of this design educational process that was created in the Mohawk Conference. Mm -hmm. They're getting exactly the type of black person they want. Teach, so right? we'll sit up and argue whether or not the Democrats or Republicans are correct or incorrect because they created the two, you know, the two options. They created that kind of black person uh, in the way they educated us. So this problem is not going to be resolved by white folks, of course. No people uh, uh, depends on another people to solve their problem. It's, it's our problem. Let's face it, it's a black problem. And to black people, decide to begin to educate ourselves in a way that will give us the proper mindset to address our issues the way they should be addressed and to black people uh, begin to take charge you know of our communities you know we had after the mike brown murder you know uh, uh yesatelli zaki baruti and those guys uh, i'm i'm a member a proud member of the university of african people's organization led by Zaki Baruti. Um, one thing that they pointed out, and one thing Zaki always points out, is a, 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 at least, at a minimum, uh, the racial demographics of the police department should reflect the demographics of that community. If you got 80% black people living in that community, it should be 80% black police officers. You know. It should never be a situation where, and he said the same thing in terms of uh, of politicians. You should, the 
the political representation right. should reflect the community, right? The demographics of the community mm -hmm. that it serves. Right. And the school districts. And the school district as well. But we're talking about, you know, uh justice in America, which is a oxymoron. Justice mm. in America just don't go together. Uh, but we still have to survive. So now uh, I know as we get, get closer to the close of this discussion, you know, we have to start thinking about sentencing. You know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, I was discussing with a friend of mine today about um, what is the statutes? You know, he was talking about, uh, you know, they project out here, well, second degree murder can get him 40 years. You know what I mean? Up my, to 40 years. Today. Huh? Up to. I yeah, said. Yeah, up, up to, exactly. Two. Up to, up to, and that's what I was discussing with him. But he was countering that by saying that I need to read about what they what the law is in Minnesota about first time offenders. They so there's a nuance. So you'll project one thing, he can get up to 40 years, but then when they say, well, first time offenders, there's a different set of rules uh that's applied. So uh we just had a conversation today. I intend on researching that. Uh and uh and so uh, and I saw some other people saying well we're gonna try to add other things into this sentencing process. Uh, because there's some somebody knows there's loopholes in the sentencing as well, so it ain't over, brothers and sisters. And like you say, many times it'll be a guilty verdict in the public, but when everything's quiet, you will start to see all this reduction of, of right. jail time that takes place right. as it follows. Mm -hmm. and, and let me say that the media also plays a huge part in the way that things are manipulated for our society because even now in the media, you will hear most of the reporters constantly saying, I was watching a news report and five or six times over when they were asked about the sentencing, they kept saying, well, he has a possibility of getting up to 40 years, mm -hmm. not, not going from like what the less that he can get, but just keep to, you know, saying 40, 40, 40, when they know that's not going to happen, <laughs> right? But they are trying to influence and, you know, they're trying to, to change how people feel about how this sentencing is going to be like a whole nother, it's a whole nother problem or issue. Mm -hmm. And this is what some of them are designed to do in the media. Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So, uh, you know, once again, you know, I, I couldn't first personally, I didn't watch this trial because I said, you know, you're not America's not going to put me through this every single time. And, you know, they're killing black. But we can even get done with this trial. And right. two or three more black people have been killed. Yes, we haven't even made it yes. through this trial. So, you know, I'm not getting ready to be riding the roller coaster every time you absolutely. keep repeating the same thing. We know it needs to be done. And we have to organize ourselves. You know, we had, I was about to mention that we had a black uh, grand jury uh, following the Mike Brown trial. A lot of people are not aware of that. I happen to have been jurist number six. And uh, we saw evidence, you know, uh, we saw video and we had discussion and we had, we put, there were witnesses, you know, family members and what have you. And, um, and then we rendered a verdict you know, uh, that uh, that he should have been indicted for first degree murder. You know, and my point is, now did we follow up? But see, see what I'm leading to, what I'm getting to is the, the idea- of, didn't make that recommendation though. No, no, I'm not talking about their, for, for, I'm not talking about in the white system. I'm saying the black folks after this is over. Oh, yes. We, or, we organized a black grand jury and mm -hmm. all of us were black and we saw the evidence and we had witnesses and, uh, and we made a decision uh, and, we, uh, the, and the verdict came back uh, that he should be indicted, that Darren Wilson should be indicted. Now, I was an advocate for taking that decision. We had black people that took the time out to see this evidence. Uh, and this is a part of self-governing, the skills and the, and the reality of being prepared that you may have to prepare for self-governing. Yes. Even in the context of America, we had a black grand jury. We came up with a decision that the man should be indicted, but we should have took that paper the way they use paper against us. Took that paper and said, we demand the arrest 
of Darren Wilson based on our findings. We were victimized as a community. It was a black man that was killed. So the black, so a black grand jury deliberated and we have findings. I and, we, and when you say black lives matter, then you demand that your findings be respected. Okay. And then that's go. the point. That should be the point of conflict. That should be the point of contention. Contention. That should be the point of maybe court case. You know, these people are saying that they have a right to be respected in terms of their decision. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't have stopped right there. We should have kept that thing going and pushed for that. We made a decision. We demand that Darren Wilson be arrested. And that's and that's what you call black power. Black power is not something to do for a demonstration or exercise of of of, 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 of legal mumble jumble. It's about actually following up on the decision that you arrived at. And so these are the things that we are going to have to start doing to show the world that Black Lives Matter because we have to believe Black Lives Matter. Nobody can't cut a check to you and say that's enough. You took the life of my person. So here comes Crump in every city and he sets it up and tell them what to say. And so when it's all said and done, I'll make sure you get a big check out of this. And then we're supposed to walk away in the sunset as though we're satisfied. No, that tells the world that black lives don't matter because a paycheck can make you feel satisfied. So we got to get out of that and start doing like everybody else in the world that really believes that their lives matter, that you literally are going to have to prove it to the world that Black Lives Matter, and you have to make people pay with life, with human life, then everybody will get that message. It's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to think about, but that's the only reality we've been forced to deal with. Right. We'll do even, another, even, sir. Go even, ahead. even the Bible says it, an eye for an eye, right? There it is, you know, an eye for an eye. So uh, a lot of times we like to, Christians, they, they they love my brothers and sisters that are Christians. They love to quote certain scriptures and they love to forget about the revolutionary scriptures that, that are there too. But, you know, it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And uh, we don't talk about that aspect of Christianity. But, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what you said. I don't know if that aspect comes from Christianity, but I hear you, brother. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying it's right, it's, right. It's, it's, I hear it's, it's a point that is uh, very often looked over mm -hmm. in, in the teachings, and, and sometimes we we need to uh, we we love our brothers and sisters where they are, but as you said, we we have to get them to a point of thinking higher and uh, holding. Uh, one another accountable and and that idea of the black jury like we said a jury of our peers and and, and if the grand jury of our elders found darren wilson guilty you know the brother it, it should have been you know but going forward we live and we learn and, and so going forward i hope that's something that we can work on and 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 do because I think, you know, that that is how you say Black Lives Matter. You you don't have to go around chanting. You don't have to go around burning buildings down in your own neighborhood where you work. And then once you set them on fire, you're unemployed. And now you haven't done anything to be self-sufficient to employ yourself. So now you've just put yourself out of a job and those that are depending on your income, you've now too just put them at risk. So we have to be smart about how we fight. You know, it's one thing to be pissed off, but it's another thing to know how to fight. You know, and that's one thing that I think as black people, we just don't know how to fight, you know, because number one, we still trying to live, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we still trying to survive. And so, you know, I get it from a holistic point of view, but uh, dear black people, wh whatever you do, you know, uh, if you want to celebrate the conviction of uh, Chauvin, you know, celebrate it. But then hear us when we say 
there's nothing to be celebrated when this has been happening for so long, you know. And it and, continues to happen. <laughs> right. This is and like he said, three three more deaths. You know, while they were deliberating the Chauvin trial, another death miles away took place. So that should tell you that they didn't care as a whole about Derek Chauvin. They didn't care about George Floyd. They don't care. You know, nothing is going to get them to stop their behavior unless you match it with equal force. Maxine Waters, you know, Liz Brown, she used to play that clip from, from Maxine Waters that says, if you want respect, nobody's going to give it to you, right? You have to go earn it. You got to go take it. You got to make people, you know, if you want justice, you make people understand that you want justice. And they're not worrying about us uh uh what do you call it protesting right we did that all summer you see and how many laws in the cities have been changed come on people so we gotta think they allowed you to chant say black life matters all summer long you know they allowed you to and see nothing this. has changed they allowed, right, they allowed you to see this so-called black and white people joining hands and singing Kumbaya, but at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself and go do the research, how many laws have changed? And if this country is serious about changing the laws, well, then how long, damn it, is it going to take to get up and do something about it? You know, but what they do is they dangle that carrot like they do at the horse race, they, they, they put it out there for you that the, the carry it to make you think you're going to catch it. And it's always looked like it's in arm's reach. Yeah, to but give you some never, hope. You're, you're never going to bite that carrot unless you cut the machine off from the racist operator that's operating the, the, the machine. I say. So He's got the carrot at the right length to just keep you thinking that justice is coming. No, we got to go to the control room, cut it off, switch who's operating the control, switch the way that we're, we're thinking, understand what justice is and what it is not. Justice was not served in this case, but accountability was finally brought to one officer while three more lives were taken. Okay, so we got to look at this thing for what it is, and we got to start thinking, you know, start thinking, people, and okay, and, 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 and while we're saying this, and we haven't touched on this really on, on too many formats, can I tell you what to do, but before you guys go run out and go get a vaccine, please go do your research. I can't tell you to take it or not to take it, but I can tell you that you need to do some research and under and ask yourself a question. Why are they given? Most Americans did not get COVID. Most, most of the society, 90 plus percent of people in America did not get COVID. So why are they trying to vaccine 90% of a healthy society? You got to think, people. Somebody's okay. trying to, somebody's trying to give you something that you don't need, or they're trying to program you into doing something that may not be in your best interest. So please, if if you don't hear anything else that we say, please learn to think for yourself and stop operating as I say on a derivative thinking platform, allowing people to flip the script. You know, it is, say doing it again. Tur. I said doing a tur. And with, the, with that being said, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap up at this point. Bible Saber, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Yes, I, just, 
I just want to say uh, thank you for inviting us to be panelists on this platform. I appreciate, I really enjoy your show. I watched just about most of the episodes. I think you're doing a magnificent job for bringing these topics to, uh, to the community to examine, to listen to, as well as uh, I, I encourage the community to play, pay close attention to the, to the upcoming trials of the other three officers who were present you know, doing this because their trials are coming up uh, uh, pretty soon. And uh, and to remember uh, that only we can control our own destiny. And at That's that shame. point, if, if you if you are if you're an individual that happens to watch this particular broadcast, uh, understand that uh, Brother Sharon, uh, Minister Sharon and myself, Baba Saber, Mari Sinepo, we are not Christians and we're not Muslims. So we just want to let you know there is alternatives to the spiritual system that you embrace. That there are al alternative ideas and concepts that are not in the mainstream of what you've been indoctrinated with or taught. So we say maybe you should take a look into uh, you know, where, where we are and what we are studying and what we're uh, 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 promoting as an option to see whether or not it fits your life. So I, I just want to say my hats off to Minister Sharon for taking his time to come here. Uh, obviously, every time he comes, we're happy to have him here because whenever you have yeah. another voice, it helps to shape and direct our people in the right direction. That, that voice is always welcome. Absolutely. And it's been an honor for me, brother, to share time and space and energy with you. I know your energy and, and more importantly, and or just as importantly as your energy, uh, I know your heart, man. You come from a really, really good place, you know, and so that that to me uh, is so important, you know. Uh, I tell people all the time, and we say it at the village all the time: people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, and that is one thing that I can say from from just analyzing you, and, and, and mind you, brothers and sisters. I, I know of Brother Saber, uh, you know, and I've worked with him very little actually in the community, even though we've been around, but I know of his work and his reputation proceeds him. And just like you heard him say, he uh, has known of me. We haven't worked together, but when like-minded spirits get together and at the end of the day, when the common goal is the liberation and the upliftment of our people, for me, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I don't care if you believe in a broomstick, as long as you are productive in the liberation of African people, that is that is what is most important to me, you know. Okay. Um, and and I would say, I would say that we've started right now in, in that process. And so what I'm going to do at this point, I'm going to say do I, do I, which means thank you to my highly esteemed panel. I am honored to have my former minister on the show and my current Baba Saba. Thank you all so much for your time and your energy and your effort, your education for our people. I want to say a do it to my parents, Princella and Roy Small, for my existence to the universe. I want to say do it to our first elder of the Temple of Het Haru, Rini Ank, and our Queen Elder, Regina Dennis Nana. I want to say do I to our Dr. Rakedi Amin for her wonderful teachings of the Meta Netter. I want to say do I to our Chief Saber Pianki Pata Mantu Nefer Amon Ra for his actual, what he did was he created all of these channels. And so we have the voices of my aunt. We have Paradigm Shift TV 314, as well as Mock Karu TV 314, where you can be educated and edified at any time. And so we want to say do I to that brother and also to our other two Sabers, Saber Kimra and Saber Metu and all of our fellow uh, members of the Temple of Heheru, and most importantly, all our children all over the world and in the community. Mm -hmm. And so that's with right. that, I'm going to leave you with Shem Imhotep, and that's Meta Netter, and it means, may you go in peace. Ashe? Okay. Ashe, good to see you Ashe. again, Good to see you, man. Thank you. 
You as well. You as well. Wow. Right. Thank you, Sister wow. uh, Queen Mother Frankie. Thank you so much. <laughs> Queen Mother Frankie. All right. All right, Minister Sherrod. Mm -mm -mm. I, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. I'm going to get it, but we're going to say Queen Mother for now. It, it's all good. Right, you, all right. You. Stay Black-tastic. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Model tip, everyone. Hotel.